Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Observable Flutter. My name is Craig Lebenz, and I am your host. And today we are going to have, we're going to complement last week's topic where we discussed using code generators and all the ways that they can accelerate your local development. And today we're going to go behind the curtain, so to speak, and peek into the process and everything that goes into actually writing a code generator because they, of course, did not uh, descend to us from on high by mere gravity. No, they were they were written by actual developers. Uh, okay, so as a reminder, everyone, folks, this is the Flutter community. Let's live up to uh, the standard that I think we all cherish, which is being a warm, welcoming, and loving community. All right, I trust you. I trust you all to do this. Today's guest is uh, needs no introduction, yet I will give him one anyway. Kevin Moore, uh, not to be confused with either of his alter egos, Kevin Less or Kevin <laughs> uh, is a prolific project manager on the Flutter team. You've seen his talks all over the place. He is uh, also an expert on code generation and has authored many a beloved package, including JSON Serializable, which I imagine is in just about every Flutter project out there. So, uh, Kevin, welcome to Observable Flutter. Hello. Good to see everybody. Um, Craig, you make me laugh so loud. I, <laughs> the horse thing, I've never heard. The Kevin Les joke I've heard. And the other thing, you mentioned alter egos. There actually is a gentleman in the Flutter ecosystem named Kevin Moore who wrote yes. a, a Flutter book. So yes. I get credit for writing a book that I never wrote. There is another Kevin Moore. Um, so I'm that's, sorry to the other Kevin. So that's why I go by Kev Moo most places. That's so great. I, I listened to, uh, I don't know if anyone here is a fan of Ad Adam Conover, uh, of Adam Ruins Everything, but he actually had oh, an yeah. episode recently where they were talking about online doppelgangers. This woman uh, is like a writer and there's another writer with her exact same name and they used to kind of have the same political leanings and then the other person like 180'd and so she gets kind of dragged through this sometimes and uh, yeah, super, super interesting. But but you're you're living this firsthand as well. I know both Kevin Moore's, you're both lovely, uh, but you are in fact different people. We are. It's true. Uh, okay. Yeah. <clears throat> True. Uh, so this brings us to today's topic, code generation. Uh, philosophically, code generation, metaprogramming, one day in Dart, potentially what, we, what we'll call static metaprogramming or... Macros. Uh, I guess macros, yeah. I mean, code generation already is static metaprogramming. Um, it's metaprogramming and it's static. But yeah. Kev, how do you think about this space holistically? <laughs> um, so it's so there's always such a great, you know, I see Randall and I see other kind of familiar people. It's so interesting to um, ponder because obviously there's lots of people. We're so lucky in our community. Like we have so many people who've gotten into programming because of Flutter and Dart, which is great. And so they might be missing kind of a computer science background or I forget the crap that I've put in my brain over the last 20 years professionally, I guess it's supposed to 30 years if you count when I started. Um, so metaprogram, the thing about the thing, like meta thought is a thought, thinking of thinking, whatever, metadata is data about data. So metaprogramming is programs that write programs. And that's what we do here. So why do we want programs to write programs? Um, it's basically humans are fallible, fallible and toil is not fun. That is it. So Jason Serializable is a great example of this. And so actually my little kind of my key thing in my brain is, is that if I have to repeat the same string more than like, if I remember more than once, I guess you don't repeat a thing once. Like if I repeat a string once, like there's two copies of a string, the exact same string and that's an important string, my spidey senses go off. Like this is bad. Especially if that string has to correspond to some like, you know, field. Um, so serialization, deserialization is a great example of this. Um, arg parsing, if people use the arg parser package, that's another great example of this where I have to find the arg parser and there's kind of a notion of what the type of the thing is, but it's only strings and booleans, right? So either flags or options. And then later I have to remember like, oh, this is a type of whatever. 
exactly what Randall said. Um, <clears throat> so it's toil to keep things up in sync and humans are fall fallible. And so you add a field to your JSON, your object. Oh, I forgot to add it to the, um, the two the JSON to from JSON. From. Yep. Or I added it to JSON and not from JSON or vice versa. Or I changed the type yep. from being int to nullable int. But oh, they remember, you know, what does it mean to be nullable now? And I have to do all the null checking of the JSON, all these things, right? And so mm -hmm. if you're repeating that a lot, have the computer do it for you. And so I remember my um, algebra class in high school, we'd have some problem and I'd sit there and I'd write the program for the thing that we were learning in class. And everyone would be 80% done with their homework because I was just writing the program. But then I would, the program would be done and then I'd slam through the homework. I'd still beat everybody. So like there's this, you know, the rule of three, we have all these things in computing, right? Which is like, when do you decide to refactor or whatever else? There are places just like, oh, spending the time to write the generator is way slower than fixing problem A, problem B, problem C. But once you get to like the 50th, the 60th, the 80th, you might mm -hmm. be further ahead and have more consistent maintainable code if you did the work to do the metaprogramming. So I think that's my philosophy. I'll stop there. Wow, that's uh, that is a, a an example rich answer as well. I I did it. I anticipated some nice philosophy, uh, but the example rich answer also great. Yeah, I I come from a Python background, which has runtime dynamic metaprogramming, lots of introspection, lots of like iterating over the fields of a thing at runtime. Uh, classes even have constructors where like all the code that you wrote on a class is passed into the, like it's un underscore underscore new. Um, and then you can just completely perform radical surgery on the class at runtime and return a completely different dictionary of things if you want. And so I, I, I feel personally very, like I, I just love the idea of, I, I said this last week and I don't, I still don't really know if this lands with anyone else or if anyone finds this useful, but I think of metaprogramming as like algorithmic compression. So when you're writing the code generator or the, the, the meta classes in Python or whatnot, you're writing the compression algorithm for, for the other algorithm, right? In, in the JSON serializable case, it's JSON serialization is the algorithm. And then the user who's a developer, they submit the compressed artifact for this process, which is a class with an annotation. And then when they run the uh, the generator, that is the decompression phase. And it, it blossoms this that little compressed artifact they had into the full algorithm. And just thinking about like algorithmic compression as opposed to a JPEG or something, it's like kind of funky, uh, but it works for my brain. And I, I do love that idea mm -hmm. of having, setting yourself up to just have this ultra terse, very, very minimal declaration that we, the human puts down into a file. And it, it you know, it grows at runtime or at build time or, you know, whenever it is, depending on your language. Um, <clears throat> but it's exactly like you said, toil's no fun. We're gonna make mistakes. So let's just write something to automate the boilerplate code. Right, because you're rarely going to have code generation for the interesting bits of your application. If you do, then you probably don't have a very exciting right. application. Uh, but that boilerplate code, like we can probably just indicate what we want it to do and have something read that indication and write it for us. So anyway. I'm, I'm totally uh, with you. And, and there gets to be some specifics about Dart. I don't know. Actually, I'm leaving, I'm leaving the interviewer. I'll let you. Go ahead. I have... <laughs> no, no. What, what do you got? What do you got? Oh, no. Just thinking about like, so like, okay, like, let's talk about in the specific case of Dart, what does it mean here? So there's a few things. One is, you know, I did um, metaprogramming in Ruby. You know, mm. I, I, you know, raise your hands in the comments if folks, um, uh, you know, watch DHH's famous, like, make a blog in five minutes Ruby thing. Mm -hmm. So much of that was this runtime metaprogramming thing. And I did other mm -hmm. similar stuff in the .NET world with reflection where you could synthesize types at runtime, you know, Ruby and Rails, yes. Um, and the problem with those, I, they're really powerful solutions. I love them, right? The trick was debugging <laughs> because now mm -hmm. you have all this mm -hmm. state at runtime and you have these types and everything at runtime. It's like, oh, like if I hit a breakpoint, if I'm stepping, where is the source? 
And a lot of people ask us in Dart, it's like, well, why don't we just, you know, why can't I use mirrors everywhere? Mirrors is kind of Dart's right. solution yep. for this. Yep. So at a practical programmer level, um, not having source is bad because it makes debugging hard. Like, how do you deal with stack traces? You know, if you have error reporting at runtime, if all this magic stuff's at runtime, it's really tricky. And then the further issue is um, ahead of time compilation is amazing. So mm -hmm. we had a huge problem with this with Dart to JS when we, we supported mirrors, which was to enable runtime reflection, I could walk up to any class or any type and inspect any aspect of it, which means I need to keep track of and compile everything, anything that might be inspected needs to be available at, in the compiled artifact, which means I need to include everything in the compiled artifact, which just blows up your runtime size. So we have Dart colon mirrors. I think right now it's marked as experimental or something. It's been around forever, but mm -hmm. the only place we really encourage people to, or I don't even, I don't know if we ever really encourage people to use mirrors anymore. They can, I think there's things that still haven't been added to it. I think it's one of those things like we kind of like to get rid of it, but some people still use it and it's kind of in maintenance mode, whatever. Um, but the fundamental thing is most of our, you know, Dart on the server, Dart on, as a developer, you don't have things pre-compiled. And so you can enumerate everything at runtime and look at things. That's what mirrors is for. Um, but for our compiled targets, you know, oh, oh, I love you too, Parker. Parker's amazing people. Everyone should, Parker's just, yeah. Um, I was praising him yesterday for things he was doing. Um, our main uh, compilation targets, the web, Android, iOS, these are all ahead of time compiled things. And we want that output to be tiny. Um, we want it to be really efficient. And so that means being able to inspect the universe and every type and every class, like we want things to tree shake. If you don't use random class foo, don't include it in the compiled output. If you don't use a getter on a prop on a class, don't include it in the output. And we can understand this at compile time with WebAssembly, with JavaScript, with ARM x86. And so that's why we really lean into the static side. Like do, if you're gonna do generation of stuff, do it before you get to the compiler. Um, and at runtime, it's just mm -hmm. tight mm -hmm. and small and fast. That's good. Yeah. And and there's a huge development time win there as well, because one of the one of my big frustrations with Python at the end of my phase of using it every day <clears throat> was that I would write these meta classes that added a bunch of stuff to a certain class that I was using. And then type hints would have no idea what I was talking about when I tried to use those things. And you know, obviously Python has had a mixed history with types. It's it's loosely typed, you know, fully duck typing, right? If it looks like a duck, quacks like a duck, it's a duck. Um, so it's like in Python, if you're the shape of a thing, then you're functionally the thing, you know? Um, <clears throat> and, but if the, if, if during development, PyHint or PyLint or, you know, whatever you're using in whatever language, um, just using Python because it's what I've used and it's the contrast, it's the foil to Dart. If it doesn't know about the output of the metaprogramming, then it will just tell you that this code that you know in your brain is going to work is an error. And Python has a solution for that. And guess what it is? Static generation of type hints. <laughs> So you just tell, you know, you, you go through some process, you annotate things, and you tell the Python linter, I promise this function will be there. Just trust me. Please stop underlining it in a red right. squiggly line. And so you you end up kind of coming back to this anyway. Um, so, so Dart is just all in on ahead of time generation, you know, of the metaprogramming artifacts. They, they currently in source gen and with build runner sit in a real file. <clears throat> and then obviously there's an evolution that is uh, kind of on the horizon for Dart, which is macros. Uh, and that's gonna have kind of more, uh, well, actually I, I haven't seen it in a while, the latest date. I know that the, the code generated by a macro is still going to exist in a file. It's just gonna be a lot like quicker and lighter in some way. Um, can you, can you speak to that a little bit, Kev? Sure. So what is like, you know, you and I both work at Google. And so, but there's this whole thing like, you know, how, if, you know, anything we see on a given day, does this represent Google, right? Like it's kind of a concentric circle thing. Like, 
Um, and so similarly, like to say Dart's opinion on metaprogramming. So when you think of like the core Dart offering or the core Flutter offering for that matter, those things don't have an opinion about metaprogramming, code generation mm. building at all yet, at all, at all. Now again, what's funny is I put on both hats. Like and sometimes I have a hat on and I am a Flutter product manager and I care about the compilers and things. And other times I have like an ecosystem hat on, right? But in terms of how mm. it's built right now, this the core of Dart doesn't understand anything about code generation. It doesn't. What, what the core of Dart and Flutter is, is we really like ahead of time compiled things. So we don't mm -hmm. want you doing runtime reflection. Runtime, we have this mirrors thing. It doesn't work in our AOT things. Um, so if you're going to do anything like this, you better just change the source code you get the compiler, right? So that leads to the solution that we mm -hmm. have in build today. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> so I'll try to give a tiny bit of history, not too much. We used to have a build tool built into the pub client. There used to be a pub serve command. This is how you know you've been in the Dart world a long time, if you remember pub serve and pub build. And basically, we they, those were there because we needed a solution for building web apps. Um, and the team that ran pub also did the build work. Um, it's the reason. So it was silly that pub had the build stuff in it. And we realized that was a bad thing and we were trying to evolve. And so that had this, what I was talking about, where pub had this like in memory thing where you could do code generation in memory. Um, you would hand over to the JS compiler, this built component. Um, so there was source code, but it wasn't really, it dealt in source code, but it really wasn't. So it wasn't runtime. It was still kind of build time, but you didn't have access to it. It wasn't on disk. And so we'd have the, and you could, so you could overwrite files and all this other stuff. So again, debugging was insane because you would, you know, in some context, you could see the source code, but it would not be this, like you'd look at one file and the file you get on disk would be different than the file that was actually being debugged. It was weird. And so, oh gosh, I guess it's eight years ago now, seven, we're like, we need to, we need to get this stuff out of pub. Pub has no business being in this, shouldn't be in this business. Pub should be the packages. Um, and we want a solution that is based on, Having files on disk, so that what like debugging was very clear, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. and we needed it at the time when we had our web offering Angular Dart, and so that's when the build system came along. It was driven by that need, so we needed something that could run, um, could do code generation. A lot a lot of it was in the context of Angular, um, and then could coordinate with our web compilers to build JavaScript. That was kind of the vision of it, and. Oh, and by the way, the nice upside is you could do all this other stuff. You could do JSON serializable or freeze mm -hmm. and these other things you could do. And we could coordinate it all together. So you could, um, so there's a whole notion of how you do things, how you define the order of stuff. So you could do the Dart code generation first, and then the Angular stuff would happen, and then the Dart to JS stuff would happen. And there was some notion of ordering there. And so what's interesting is obviously, you still, the use on the web still exists. You can still use, you know, build web compilers as a package and you can use it to build a web app. So if you're building a web app with Dart that is not on using Flutter web, and those exist, my web page is one of those now. Like as I tell people, Flutter web is not the best thing for landing pages. You want to be small and SEO friendly. So my web page is a vanilla Dart app. That's very simple, very simple vanilla Dart app that lists, this thing will be on there soon. Um, and that uses build web compilers. That uses the build system. Flutter's build system is completely different. And there was a point where I was like, why aren't you using our the Dart build system for Flutter? I mean, there'd be a lot of upside to that too. Um, and it turns out like they had to coordinate all these native things, native compilers. Um, they were trying to move fast. And so this is always the trade-off, right? Like, do we how much slower do we have to go to coordinate a consistent, coherent story? And is it worth the the churn to make sure? Mm -hmm. And at the time, the Flutter folks were like, we're just gonna crank ahead and make it work. And then by the time they had it all working, the idea of throwing it all away and going back and trying to coordinate with the build system, the Dart build system, it didn't happen. So now we have this weird thing where we kind of have two builds and people have to run build, you know, build, you're on the build system and then you run your Flutter build system and that's just bad. And this is where I'm getting to with, with our macros proposal. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so the build system is completely separate than Dart. It's outside of Dart. It uses packages. It uses the, the analyzer package, a bunch of other stuff. It generates sources to disk. Um, it tries to do the right thing. And then, but it's a separate process you have to run. It's a separate set of packages. It's not versioned with the Dart SDK. And then you have to worry about, especially in the Flutter case of, I need to do my code generation step, have that done. And then I need to run the Flutter compiler. And if I want to have like Flutter, you know, Flutter run working with hot reload, 
it's possible. Actually, I haven't done it much. I haven't done much of this with Flutter apps. So it's it's not ideal. We'd like to be cleaner. Mm -hmm. um, and we've done a much work to make it fast. There's a whole crazy amount of work. This is actually work that has happened with the analyzer to make sure we're caching things correctly. So if you change one file, we don't have to reanalyze the whole universe. But it is a complex problem, right? Like, because mm -hmm. the analyzer, you know, bool and string and list never change, generally in the context mm -hmm. of running a builder. So ideally, you want to be smart and say, oh, if I'm changing some class up here, that might have transitive effects, right? Like my cache mm -hmm. value of how many properties are on the foo class changes if I change the bar class. Mm -hmm. if, 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 far, if, foo, if foo extends bar, right. Yep. My knowledge of what foo is, the shape of foo, if it's, you know, if it has getters or setters, if it's it's a valid class, right? Like if I suddenly add of an abstract um, member to bar and I don't implement it in foo, foo is now invalid. And so there is this kind of like concentric circle thing where as I change a class, I might invalidate things that subtype it. I might invalidate code that references those types or subclasses of that type, whatever. And so there's a lot of logic in there. So you'll see a little bit we might get in today. The build systems tries to be very smart. It understands the dependencies between files. It knows if one file references another file, and if that file, if, if the file that's referenced changes, anything that references it and everything that references those files transitively mm. also changes. Mm. It's a bunch of graph math. It's like all fun computer science. So the build <laughs> system is doing a lot of work here for one important thing, which is you want you want two properties that are really hard. Um, you want her, a hermetic build system. So this is vocab check. Do you know what hermetic means? Uh, hermetic is like sealed, right? Like uh, not contaminated. Exactly. So if you follow the rules in our build system, and this is actually important, there are rules. So if you're to build, if you want to write a builder, you can only read files. You only want to read input. One, you want to have hermetic input. So you never want to include like a date time or like a web a web query into a build output. Never. Yeah, because those you'll get change. different, right? You run it twice, you'll get a different output. Right. So um, so you want that, right? Which is if no inputs change, the output doesn't change. And if two people run the same build with the same configuration, they should get the same result. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm sure there's a better computer science answer to this, but like functionally speaking. So you want that. And then also you want maximal incrementality, which means if I change tiny things, I don't have to re-evaluate the universe. Like if I change a tiny thing on the edge, mm. I don't want to have the whole build system to have to go parse and ponder the whole universe to figure out like what's mm -hmm. the state of things, right? And those two things are in conflict, right? Like what do we do when our builds get borked? We do build clean in any context, right? Flutter clean, every build system, yep. make, we all have this clean command, right? Which is like, something's weird, I'm going to reset the world and start over. Yeah, we somehow got in an inconsistent state. Right. Um, and that's obnoxious because, like, that slows everything down. Like, the way, I mean, there's great YouTube videos on Google's build system. I think you just search for Blaze or Basil as the public Yeah, version. yeah. Um, talking about this is what you want, right? Like, you want highly consistent mm -hmm. builds. So, like, things are, and you also want, like, oh, like, some other dude or person compiled this thing five minutes ago. Let me borrow 99% of all his outputs or their outputs, and I will do my 1% delta. And so builds are insanely fast. Yep. This is what you want. So that's what our build system tries to do. Why it's nice to use a Dart, the Dart build system versus just, because you can write, generate, write some shell script that generates code and dumps it in your disk. The build mm -hmm. system gives you is this, is, is, I just saw my video glitch. Um, Maximum hermes hermeticity. Oh yeah, good. good. My Mac things, um, <laughs> and also maximum incrementality. That's and it's a hard it's a hard problem, right? Because it's always easy. Um, it's always easy to just blow up everything and start over. Um, but there are some right. downsides. Yeah, it's not integrated into the SDK, and so that's where the macro stuff comes. I don't know if you want me to. I know I'm just a fan watching the macro work, so I'm, I'm happy to speak to it a tiny bit. But I don't know if that's where you want to go now. Um. Well, maybe we could, uh, maybe we should look at, I, I think maybe we should end with macros and that'll kind of be okay. the future looking version. Um, you know, folks, one, we can get in, get into actual source generating very shortly here. One question that Kevin and I were talking about before the stream, and as we were debating, like, does this even make sense on the eve of macros probably landing? Um, we're optimistic, is, yes. 
Yeah, it is just like, well, macros is going to, to some extent, and maybe fully kind of deprecate source gen, which is what we're about to use. And so does it make sense so. to talk about, right, hopefully, does it make sense to talk about it now? And well, A, macros may not arrive if the developer experience is, is never smooth enough. So in that case, of course, then learning source gen will uh, be a lasting skill. And B, a lot of the philosophy and a lot of the way you approach a problem will survive from source gen into macros. And so uh, we ultimately settled, obviously, here we are. Um, but yeah, macros will be kind of the, hopefully, the future of this. A lot of the understanding, a lot of the concepts uh, will carry forward. The names will change to protect the innocent, so to speak, that old dragnet line. Uh, and hopefully the developer experience will be better. It'll be a lot faster. But yes. yeah, well, let, let's let's hop into uh, source gen, and then um, then we'll look forward once we've explored that. Okay. Okay. So uh, now one. Oh yeah, good. You brought up source gen. So open up just a blank text file, so I can type. Oops. So we can type some stuff out just to put in front of our users. I was initially I was gonna code here, and then Craig's like, "I got it. You're gonna talk to me," and I was like, "Oh, this is gonna be fun." So, uh, <laughs> package package colon build. Write that out. This is the root yeah, of the universe, and specifically, there is a builder type in that package universe. Yeah. So when we talk about code generation or writing a code generator, I cringed a little bit. Because terms matter, right? We are in a highly typed thing. Builder is the root of everything here. And it's a simple type. Actually, if you do the, I don't know, I use VS Codes. I mean, I use IntelliJ still. I need to get over to VS Code. I haven't yet. But just do find symbol builder and see if it comes up for you. I'll have to, uh, I'll have to say. Hmm. Oh, see, in IntelliJ, you can see the whole tire. Because it's in the build. Well, package. I'm in a text file, so I, I'm not. Oh, open up, open up something in the source because you're in source gen, right? Open up, yeah, open yeah. up something there. Sure. Oh, actually, yeah. You just go to definition here. Scroll down. Mm -hmm. Um, go to the, go to definition builder, the very top of that file. Like, oh, here scroll we go. down a little bit further. Okay, here we've got extends builder. So the we're immediately in an, a primary. Don't worry uh, about that. Go to. Yeah, go to the builder definition. I go a little bigger again here. Oh yeah, okay, sorry. Uh, builder. Yep. Okay. So I this, found it. It's in these. So actually, context for everyone. This is you know this live stream will be in, unless one of us says something embarrassing will be saved forever on YouTube. I'm going to go a little fast because we're already 28 minutes in. We only have an hour. So if you don't catch it all here, that's fine. I'm going to show you where the breadcrumbs are. Yeah. Quick. Uh, we can go over an hour. I often run about an hour and a half. Oh, good. Um, if you only have an hour, then that is a thing. But uh, we don't have to stop in 30 minutes. Oh, wonderful. Yeah, I'm. you have me, Craig, until 11 o'clock Pacific. So I, I think, yeah, I, I'm. my calendar's booked out. OK, anyway, back to this. So the root of the universe is builder. Look, abstract class. Here's an abstract function built. So that is where all the magic happens, is built. So future or, which means it can be synchronous or asynchronous, depending on what APIs you call. You notice it doesn't return anything. So what mm -hmm. you do is the build step has all the magic in it. And so build step gives you a bunch of information about your inputs. And then it gives you the ability. So like you, every, every build step has a primary input. And that could be a real input, like a Dart file, or it could be a synthetic input, like the notion of a package. And there's some weird terminology there that I won't get into. You'll have to read. Um, and then in the build step is what you write. So you, you can read inputs. You can read the primary input, which is, in our case, often a Dart file. It could be many files. You could read actually other files as well. And then you write two outputs in the build step. And so the build step gives you functions to read and write. You only so if, I'm, go ahead. so if I'm writing a package that uses source gen, if I'm writing a code generator, and I, yeah. you, you took umbrage with some phrasing somewhere, and we should get to that at some point. Um, 
I am going to extend builder or I'm I'm am I going to primarily write build steps? So where, where, this is let's add happen? some notes here. Let's add some notes here. So um, add another line here, which is package colon. Yeah, that's um, package colon build underscore runner. Yep. This is the this is the CLI. This is the thing that runs builds. So we talk about build versus build runner. Build is the API you code against. Build runner is the CLI tool. This gives you the build runner CLI command. Got it. Yeah. A bunch yep, of other yep. stuff there too, right? So when you talk about I'm using build or build runner, like just it's kind of important to understand this. So usually what happens is if you want to run build runner in a package, you need a dependency on build runner, and it should be a dev dependency. This yep. is not a runtime dependency, right? Dev dependency. And this gives you the build runner pub run build runner build whatever. Okay, add another line here. Package colon source gen. This has a so this is a wrapper around build. All source gen is is a bunch of convenient stuff around build. That is it. So if you have a gen code generator in source gen, it's actually I mean it's a little bit of work. It's not trivial. But you can dig in and you're like, oh, like there is a, so source gen ships builders in the box. They're called part builders and library builders. So they are mm. builders. And then what you do is you feed into those generators. So generator is the concept in source gen. So generator is a bit of code. <laughs> it's you write, a, you write a little bit of code. You, you don't have mm -hmm. to like, it'll, source gen does a bunch of wiring for you to do the builder. Um, and so what you do is you have a generator that generates and it's actually more functional. Like in the, in the builder context, you, you have this thing and you read inputs and outputs and in source gen, you can return a string or a list of strings or a stream of strings. If you want to, I think I need to look, um, okay. so you, it's functional and then it puts it in a spot for you. And so you don't have to think so hard about this is my input as asset ID and this is my out output asset ID. So it's a bunch of just helpers. It makes it, it raises the level of abstraction up. It limits what you can do. Source gen is meant for source. So builder can read a YAML file and write an HTML file. Source gen is like, I read in Dart files, usually only one Dart file, and I write out a single Dart file. Got it. But source gen is not magic. And none of this is magic. It's complex, but it's not magic. But source gen is a constrained set of helpers that, you know, source gen has the concept of, oh, I want to annotate something. And then for everything that is annotated with this thing, I want to get called for every one of those annotated things. And I can output some stuff for that annotated thing. And then with mm. source gen, that's the generator. And then the builder that source gen gives you takes all those little outputs and glues them all together and writes the output to build. Got it. Got it. So the the those builders from source gen, they are kind of the glue that again, the, the boilerplate of this, um, assembling all the things, getting them into the right target file, all of that kind of tedium. Right. So deep breath would be cool there. So so if people want to understand build and how build works, there's a Dartling build re repo. It has a bunch of packages in it. There's like build web compilers and there's um, there's just a crazy, amazing amount of stuff. And there's reasons why we have all these individual packages and it was very well thought out, but it's a little complex now. But I would highly encourage in, so Dart, you know, GitHub slash Dart dash Lang slash build. Um, in there is an example directory. Actually, yeah, bring it up. It's not a bad thing to do. In there is an example directory. If you scroll down, I think it's just called example. Yes. And in this, you will look at, there's a build.yaml file that describes how things are configured. We'll get into that in a second. So these are all the individual builders. Um, mm. And then, I don't, I think we'll stick with source gen today. I'm just pointing, and then click on example, go back one level and go into lib. And then builder.dart exposes all the builders. And so there are four builders here. And so there's a correspondence. Every one of these things corresponds to an entry in the build.yaml file. I'm gonna wave my hands here a little bit, but if you want uh, to see, and some of these look at Dart code, some of these like look at, at just generate text based on stuff. But if you wanna understand like at the simplest level, 
And so instead of starting a new project, I'd say is go into this example directory, run pill, um, pub run build runner um, watch, I think it is, mm -hmm. which will just kind of run it and yep. then start editing stuff, like edit the inputs, edit the builder. And this is where I, I recommended to you earlier, having a git diff tool on your machine. Because right, if you have right. a diff tool, it's very easy to see, oh, these are the files that are changing. Is something actually changing? So in an, an ideal cool. configuration, what I do, at least personally, is I have I have my nice 4K monitor. Thank you, Google. You can see where my hands are here. And I have half my screen that is my source code editor. So it's like, you know, two panes up. And then on the other side of my screen, one corner I have my Git GUI, and the other corner I have my command line. Mm -hmm. And my command line is probably running pub run build runner watch which is basically just keep running builds, watch files, yep. rebuild. And so those now, are my question. Yeah. Question here, you said how, uh, like get into that kind of state, you know, get all the stuff up and then start changing the inputs and see how the outputs change. Where are the inputs and how in looking at this, would I figure that out? So if I, you look uh, at the web, open the web directory there in the example, yeah, there you go. So I, I, my understanding is, yeah, like you'd have to go look so what, at each what builder What designated now. that these are the inputs? So go look at build.yaml. I think that's what I was on before, yeah. Okay. So there's an example. So this is a copy builder. It builds to source. Um, go, I'm sorry, go to the very top. Its inputs are text files and its output is a text.copy. It is the simplest builder in the world. It's like, take every text file in your project and make mm -hmm. a new file called text.copy with the exact same outputs. Inputs is output, that's it. So if you're just like, oh, this is the simplest possible thing. There's a copy builder. There you go. Um, okay. The next one, okay. Next the next one, one resolving is, builder. So this is showing, um, so build is tightly integrated with the analyzer and it does all this work with the analyzer to be super efficient. And so what we do is when you use the build system and you target a dark file, the build system does the work so that when you act, when that build step is called, you're handed an instance of the analyzer in an analysis context. And that analysis context, we're pretty much guaranteed that you'll have a valid analysis context for the f file you're interested in and everything it depends on. So mm -hmm. that you can inspect that class, you can inspect subclasses and mix-ins and whatever else, imports and do mm -hmm. stuff. And that's using the resolver, like you, res you resolved AST, the resolved analysis context. And so in this case, I take a Dart file as the source, and I output information about that Dart file. So in fact, if you go back and look at the web directory now, um, for an example, okay. you'll see yep. um, index at Dart.info. Oh, I might oh, be yeah, wrong. Yeah. Oh, I might be wrong. I might click on that. Yeah, index that's at interesting. Dart I might, I might have missed an extension or something. Oh yeah, so if you click on index at Dart, you'll see that there are, I import some stuff and I have a member, my main. And if you click on info, um, what you'll see here is, what I do is I just dump some info. So click on that guy again. Where, where's what? info? Oh, info. the in, index. Yeah. That dart, that info. Yeah, like, yeah, oh, yeah. like this is my input and I found one member and the number of libraries that traverse transitively in my universe is 26. And so that's so all there. Yeah. Where did these three statements get declared? Go look at builder.dart. Builder.dart. Up, up, up. Okay. Yeah. Builder.dart. And you'll see that I am example is where the code is. And so this, this is it. In... UI is like jumping around on me like crazy. And I don't know what You're I'm doing to make it happen. So go look at now example.dart is actually where you need to be. Sorry. So these these are the builders. These are the, so there's a convention here. So builder.dart is where you put your builders. Um, do you know how to get the left panel back? <laughs> Well, just click on example. So build slash example to top. Oh, it always reappears when I uh, change the zoom. And then go look at example. Not the intended. Okay, example dot dart. Where? Example dart. Oh, there we go. Example dot dart. Okay. And so this is a copy builder. The easiest thing in the world. I add. Uh, I create a. I write a string. So you notice I'm using the build step. So I'm reading the content as a build step, and then in line nineteen, I create a new asset ID, which is where stuff goes. And I just add an extension copy and then I write out the stuff. Oh, and at the top, I also write copied from whatever and then the content. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then I say these are my extensions. So great. Again, we're this... all in builder land. This is sort of, yeah. But 
Yeah, no, this this is uh, this is the magic here. You were talking about we extend a builder, a yep. build step comes in. So in this case, the builder is where you spent your time. You did not implement a custom build step. That's one thing I was wondering earlier. I did. I implemented uh, builder. That's a build step. But the the you imp, you implemented the build method. You did not yes. subclass the build step class. There's no 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 build step is data. Okay, so we do not spend time implementing custom build steps. We those are just stock off the shelf from the analyzer, you know, based well, on established system, rules. But with a bunch yeah. of analysis data in it. Build step is a bad name because it's like it's not the build step. It's like the well, it's kind of it's like this is this is the context that we allow you to this is the hermetic context that we are allowing you to play in build implementer and so what's great about this is if you try to read a file that is not in the universe of stuff that build knows about it'll mm -hmm. error out like you cannot mm, read it wouldn't be hermetic at that point because now i'm reading some random i'm reading dev slash random it'll blow up this is why we have asset yeah, ids yeah. not paths you have to use a random valid asset id which has it's either a library or a file whatever else and then when yeah, you write, okay. you can only write to things that are in the context that you care about. It, you have to write to extensions that you said you are going to write to. You cannot mm -hmm. overwrite anything that already exists because that breaks mm -hmm. hermetic. Yep. And so now you're on. So if you use Dart IO, file read, file write, whatever in this mm -hmm. thing, you will be in a world of pain. Never, ever, ever use Dart IO, file read, file write, or anything that calls those transitively. Got it. And, and, you know, one, one thing you said earlier is like, you can always just write a shell script that reads some input and spits some Dart code out. And, you know, so if you're tempted to use Dart IO, then it sounds like that's what you should be doing. Just do that. It's just not, not even using the build system at all and just exactly. figure out your own way to define some YAML or whatever and turn that into a Dart class. Okay. Amazing. Uh, and so, so that we could was... go into this deeper or we could jump to source gen. I was just saying this, if people understand the guts. So anyway, really quickly, there's the resolving builder that you look at the output. I went right. and I took the build step. I got a resolver. I'm like, how many libraries are in that resolver? You know, entry point mm. dot top level elements at length. How many entries are here? And so I take a Dart file and I generate a text file. Like here's some random data. So if you put this in your project, you'd suddenly have text files. All, and actually, this is where I have my bug, right? Because in line 67, I say .info. And in the build.yaml file, I say info.yaml. So I need to fix that. That's wrong. Um, Got it. And oh, interesting. Yeah. So in the this build code, right, the, the code generation code is already following, uh, falling for the a same, like a string had to be the same in two places trap. Yes, right. and this code is already demonstrating the very pain that it tries to solve in other code. <laughs> yes, and the problem with this, so the problem here is we needed to so have a build.yaml file, which repeats stuff that's already in the builder because you have extensions. Scroll down a little bit. There's a build extension that's overridden. Mm. Um, yep. The problem is we needed an asset that was not in Dart code so we could create a build graph without actually running the code. So that's why there's it's in build.yaml because once we're running the dark code in the builder like and so there's a whole thing about we should there was a bug like we should make sure that those two things are consistent and blow up if they're not we just haven't got to it but in theory there's reasons why you have to define it twice um so we could spend more time here i think going to source gen will be better for most people but if you okay. want to know where the rubber hits the road this is the directory you go into build slash example i try to keep them very incremental very small like you know st stumble around in here Got it. Okay. Now I have source gen uh, checked out, but we yep. just had some moderate success poking around directly in GitHub. By the way, folks, one thing Kevin said shortly before we went on is like, we're not going to get very far if we actually write some of this. So we should poke at the existing examples. So that is actually what we're going to do and hopefully understand it like we Ideally, just did a little bit in that build example. So, Kev, GitHub or VS Code? What do you think would I be think, best? Because eh, let's do VS Code because then you can files open. Okay. And we have tabs and refer to things, right? All right. I'm going to try to keep this unbelievably large font size for uh, posterity. Um, All right. So where? Uh, so I would open up now. I would go so the open up your sidebar there, 
And so there's source gen. So this is a this is a this is a um, mm -hmm. mono repo, which is so weird because yes, it is one repo, so mono, and mono means one. I guess it means one repo for many packages. Yeah, they're all. So I guess mono repo yeah. means you have many packages, but one one repo. repository. So source okay. gen in the source gen repository, there is a one package that is published called source gen. There are yep. three extra packages. One is for testing stuff, that's test annotations. And then there's two other packages. There's example and example usage. Example is the implementation of the stuff. Like this is this is JSON serializable or whatever. This is the package that you'd publish that has a generator in it. And then there's a second package, example it usage, uses. which uses exactly. that generator. And so, you know, and the problem is if you look at the build example, it's all together. So the package that uses the builder mm. is also the package that defines the builder, which if you're yep. doing one, your, your app, and you want to write completely bespoke generators and builders for your app, sure, put them all it together. It would be actually that, yeah, yeah. But it is common or nice often to have a package that is the generator, and then you want to use yep. that in one or probably more than one package, right? Um, mm -hmm. And so keeping the, that's why I have it separate here. Because otherwise, because they both have a build.yaml, so in one context, build.yaml defines the configuration of the package that is defined. So there's builders. These are the builders in this package. Mm -hmm. And then if you go to example usage, it's like, oh, here is the configuration for the builders I am using. And there are two separate yes. things, right? So the other one defines all possible builders from that package. And then this one opts into what to run and specific behavior, yeah. uh, again, exactly. options that this package will actually make use of. So, you know, again, in retrospect, oh, we should have had, you know, we could have a two files. It could be like build definitions and build whatever. We put them all in one file mm -hmm. name with two different sections, whatever. But you have some context now. Um, right. So let's go look at example lib. Okay, I'm going to close a bunch of stuff here. I'll try to keep our notes file open. I don't mm -hmm. If after a certain amount of time we don't write any more in here, then sure. I'll just get rid of it. Uh, okay, where am I going? Scroll up a bit. So there's an example directory. This is where we're defining yep. the generator. The lib, you said, right? Yeah. So convention, open builder.dart. Um, we're builder.dart? Lib, lib slash builder.dart. Oh, there it is. Been a snake so our, con our convention here is if you define a builder in a package, and these are, so sort this is a source gen package, but in the end, source gen is an implementation detail. In the end, you have a you don't have to put it in builder.dart. You put it anywhere because builder.yaml, but there's a convention here, which is use builder.dart. So mm. this has a number of builders. So builder is the package build thing. It exposes mm -hmm. builders. That is where the rubber hits the road. And build.yaml configures builders. Now, if you look a little bit deeply, you'll see, oh, there is a, so some builder, look at some builder, line 31. Mm -hmm. And then look at line 32. I'm returning shared part builder. Guess what? That is from source gen. This is the helper. This is your helper source. Mm. So I don't have to implement a builder. Source gen gives it. And what source gen says is, give that me was the uh, ships builders to get you started note that we wrote. And so that in, you know, parenthetically after that, you could say shared part builder in text if you wanted to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Shared part builder and and uh, and these others maybe property some generator. So that or did you is a generator. So what you do is you have a builder that is shipped in the box in source gen. Okay. You implement one or more generators. You can actually put many generators into one builder. All right. Walk me through uh, the difference between a generator and a builder. What is it? What is a generator? A generator is a source gen specific thing that okay. gives you this. So it gives you a library reader, which is just a high, an easier way to go through and look at a library. And okay. then it lets you return very functionally the code. So instead of like mm -hmm. doing build step and I have to like write the library, I can say, oh, like I'm just gonna go and for every top level member, I'm gonna emit um, a printer for that member or whatever. And I yep. can just generate strings and return a string. And actually what's crazy is you can return a string, you can return a feature of string, you can return a list of string, you can return a stream of string, I think. Yes. All in generate? Generate if you if you go up to the implementation of generate from generator, I think it's defined as 
Oh, future or str sorry, future or string question mark. So yeah, you get to return null, which is I don't want to do anything. Um, the I swear the idea that similar. this could also return a stream, I was like, how did you define that method? Uh, oh, no, okay. I have a helper was... there. Never mind, there's something else. Yeah. Um, where is that? I have code that does it somewhere. Anyway, so you can either return a string or a future of string or null, which is like, hey, I looked at whatever you gave me. I'm not going to party here. No op. Okay. I cannot. The the tool tip is always it's omnipresent. What tool? And I oh I love six years ago I wrote this function. That's great. I love to see that. Um, on line thirty. Okay. The uh, oh. <laughs> okay, so a generator comes from source gen. Source gen for generator. Yep. Yeah, and it is a utility class that is passed not just a build stamp, but this library reader. Mm -hmm. Now you were also reading the library back in build, right? That's how you transit it. That's how we looked at that one file that said like, these were how many uh, files were there. This is how many dependencies are, or, you know, whatever the, those three declarations that you had, you were also reading the library there. So what is it? Go to the definition the of library that... reader for me. Go to the definition of library reader. Okay. Oh yes, this is this is uh, Matan. Thank you, Matan. Um, so library reader is a helper on top of library element that just mm. gives you a more convenient API. You can still get to the underlying library element. This is the analyzer AST, but it gives you a mm. bunch of helpers to find a type, to enumerate all the elements in a class. Like it, it's it's doing a bunch of work just to make it easier to party on a library. That's what it gives you. Got it. Got it. Got it. Okay, right. So we call these methods instead of rewriting their painful internal guts. Great. Right, this is just some helpers. So the generator has, I think, if I'm following the plot here, it has two layers of convenience. One is that it is past this convenience wrapper around the library. And two is its return type is very simple. It's a string. Whereas back in Builder, you had to actually right to the asset strings directly keep track of right? the asset so in this world it's like oh mm. what we'll do is like hey you have so this is what's called a part so this is generator ah let me go back actually there is so now go to part generator is the lowest level thing um mm -hmm. you can open up so go back to our um example.dart your example oh okay oh, sure that's where no, that's fine. This, this is fine um so you see there's a shared part builder so open one of these guys, property, product, generator. I don't know, any of those. Property, sum, generator. Anything. Okay, good. that's where we just were, yep. <clears throat> ah, so you see here, I go and I look at the library and I find all the top-level number things and I just drain some text, which is like the sum of all of them. And then I return a thing. Interesting. So top-level num variables. This is just a helper I wrote. All right, so the, now now we're really getting into some of the nitty gritty stuff here. So top level num variables. Let, let's take a step back here and, and really appreciate what we're looking at. The generator, the example generator that we are in, this would be if as if you had some class with a bunch of number fields. Mm -hmm. And uh, and it, and pretend it makes sense to sum them. So it's the amount of money you have in one bank account and the other bank account in your pocket and you know in your couch cushions. And so we want to sum all of those numbers to find out how much money this person has in this class. And sure. so you are writing a generator to attach to that class to, again, not just sum those four things that I just enumerated, but make it easy to not forget to also sum the fifth one when you right. add that. Right. So that's so, kind of the. Yeah. And again, I see then, Ben SNR saying, I'm kind of lost at this point. So let's get it really concrete. So open up your command line. So one, yeah, that's, uh, sorry. Let's G run it and play with it and see how it works. Oh, there we go. Um, yeah, we're going to do that in just a second. I, I'm, I'm, I'm okay. actually, I'm with G Ben. I'm a little lost myself. I'm trying to orient myself here. Um, so we have this, we have some other class that we're going to put this on and maybe we'll, we'll do this in a moment and it has all these different number fields and you realize i want a bespoke generator for this to at find 
right? There's two tasks here. Find all the number fields, and that's done at build time, and then yep. sum them at runtime. Well, and... you create a, you find all them all, and then create a member in a part file mm. that sums them all. Yes. yes I don't have yes, to worry yes. about keeping track of every one of my fields. I just have to worry right. about making sure the builder runs, and then I'll have this great function that gives me the sum of all my numeric fields. Yes. Now, the then the trick here is that somebody has to loop over all of the attributes on the class and figure out which ones are number fields suitable for summing. And that yep. utility didn't exist because it's pretty specific. And so that's very where specific. you as a hypothetical, well, you as a very real uh, code generation author had to write this top level num variables method. And it's in this utils file. And what it does is it takes in this reader, it looks at all the elements, it uses this uh, kind of high level filter where type. So it's going to loop over all the elements and extract only the ones that are a top level variable element. Now mm -hmm. this this is all is... So, I, I, let me take one step back just so oh, you know, I, I, always, I always talk about learning how to program. People don't realize how hard it is because if you're brand new to programming, it's like, oh, you're learning how IDEs work, you're learning how abstract notion of a programming language works. You're learning the specific programming language you're learning, like Dart. You're learning the framework, Flutter. So like, you're not just learning how to program, you're learning like five concepts. And so your head gets mushy. Mm -hmm. So I want to be clear here for people that are confused. And this is why this video will be up online. I tried to post a bunch of examples because you are learning there's a build thing and concepts from build. Talk about that and how to run build runner. Mm -hmm. There's this really nice, convenient thing, source gen, which is a nice layer on top, but it's a separate set of concepts that relate to build, but like it's a separate thing and it has its own nerd, like there's generators instead of builders. And then there's a third thing, which is if you've never used the analyzer package, it is enormous because it covers mm -hmm. everything you can do in Dart. And so this idea of like, oh, like top level variable element and element dot type dot is Dart core num. So when you're looking at this stuff and you're like, ah, like, okay. There's build API stuff that you need to understand. There's source gen stuff that you understand. And if you want to get deep into like, I want to inspect this library and I want to find mm -hmm. all the classes that are abstract, but not base that implement this interface and have these properties. Like there mm -hmm. is just, there is many hours of spelunking through the analyzer API <laughs> to figure <laughs> out the exact way to figure that out. And so yeah. everyone take a deep breath. You're learning three concepts. Build's not too bad, but it has nuance. Source gen's not too bad, it has some nuance. Analyzer is enormous because it has to be, because it represents everything that is Dart. And so just take a deep breath. Like there's some complex concepts here. You can do it, start simple. Do not try to mm -hmm. replicate just JSON serializable. You'll go insane. I have lots of blood, sweat, and tears and conversations <laughs> with that. With, yeah. Okay. So like take a deep breath. This is not, this is not, there's a lot of concepts here. It's okay. We'll work through it. Um, but I want to make sure people That's don't get discouraged. Just a wonderful pep talk. Um, and yeah, so we're looping over the elements. And if they're either a num, an int, or a double, then they get included in our list of iter of, of fields. Yep. And then they go into this method that we sum. And look at the simplest thing. I take all the things and it's like, oh, element.name, just join them. So now I have a string, which is like foo plus bar plus yep. baz, whatever those fields are. Yep. Yep. And then I return just a text, a piece of text that is, happens to be Dart source code. Right. That's all we're doing. Uh, okay. So I, it, it's coming together a little bit. No, it's, it's coming together a decent bit for me. Um, I'd love to hear. I'm going to try to look at the chat. I missed the last one, Kev. Thank you for seeing it. Folks, if there's any other, like, wait, what the something, what? Can you go back? Please type it in the chat. Um, all right, now, Kev, you had mentioned wanting to actually run something. Yeah, and so I, open up your I terminal. agree, it's time. And we'll have fun. And this is where the diff thing is nice, too. Um, source gen slash example usage. So CD slash example usage. My uh, Awesome. Now, in here. Size of my window is a little awkward there. Okay. Hub run build runner. Actually, no, I'm sorry. It's dart run. Ah, <laughs> I'm old. Yeah, you just dart went run. back in time. Dart run build runner underscore runner. Isn't that like build, build, build underscore runner or something? No, just dart run build underscore I'm not runner. Lie. I only use, oh, whoops. I only use control R for this. All right. 
start, run, build, runner, build. Ah, I then, knew there okay. was the two things. There you go. So build. So you could do watch. So I don't actually replace build here with watch. Okay, let's do it. Um, I would include the delete conflicting outputs dash dash. This is good because if you change builders and like it can't figure out what the output or the input is, like things can get overwritten. So it's just like this is like a sledgehammer. So this is why it's good to use mm. git. Use git, yeah. and then you can use this, and then you don't have to worry about prompting because it'll say, "Are you sure you want to delete this?" And you click Y, and then do that one. Also. Okay. One story from the frontier here. I did one PR for freeze. Uh, four years ago, I'm guessing this means that's sort of my love-hate relationship with package analyzer. Yeah, it's yeah, it is a beast, as Kevin. It's said. a necessary beast. It's one of these like some things are just necessarily complex. Um, right, and then do right. dash dash for both as well, and this yeah. just gives us nice of output, and then run that. All right. Now, where is something going to appear? I'm going to close some files. So nothing is going to happen now because nothing should have changed. Oh, so and the like, generated code is committed, of course. So this is sucking in the universe. It's generating a summary, like a whole analysis summary of the SDK. See, look, you can look there. Look, all the generators are being run, and then nothing changed. Okay. So if you go to example, we, yeah, we're good example usage, usage lib. Um, they do info.dart, maybe? Is it info.dart, maybe? Well, I'm guessing this is the generated, and then this is oh. our... Where's the part? Oh, the part might have disappeared. Try doing like a refresh. There oh, should be a library source dot g dot dart. I can look at my code now. Kevin has one of the other. There is. Right? Why is it not appear? Oh, I wonder if I like hit it in um, my global. Let's see here. Don't do that. That makes everything difficult. Yeah, well, I've mostly been a consumer of these. Yeah, okay, files exclude. Here we go. Uh, you can see I use these as a consumer and have often not wanted to be <laughs> bothered with the contents. So here we go. And now if I come back, we've got it. So now, so there's, you know, look, I even have like um, a multiplied all product. The sum should be down there a little bit, right? Hmm. Okay. Yep. Yeah. So now yep. go into the library source and add who's someone we should make a shout out to. Let's um, let's do a shout out to Devin. Actually, no, Parker. Let's do a shout out to Parker. Mm. Um, cost Parker equals what's a good number? A hundred, because Parker's just a hundred. You know, hundred out of a hundred. Save. Yep. Now hit save. Yep. Right? I got to go back to watch. Oh, did it kill the, tr the process? I did because I wanted to ls the directory and make sure the file was there, which is what okay, made me sure. remember that I cool. had hidden it in settings. Okay, now save the file. I think it's, I still see it. It's dirty. Okay, right. yeah, there we go. So save. It just ran. Now to, and now look, there's Parker. Go rename Parker to like Parker. I don't know what. Rename answer. I don't know. Whatever you want to do. Sure. And go look at the G file. There it is. So Great. now we have our engine. We can go in, we can add arbitrary fields, and they'll be added, and they'll be, you know. Now, all of this comes from, like, this multiplier declaration did what? Like, ah, so we only talked about the sum builder so far, right? We've only talked about the sum builder. I so, think so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So go back to the sum builder, and let's just kind of take a deep breath and look at the sum builder. Oh, I see. So if we put like 10 here. Well, I haven't yeah. got into any of that yet. Yeah, but we can this get there. This would be 10. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but th this is, so, so, okay. So now add, um, ans who's someone else we give a shout to? We should give a shout to Randall. So new do const Randall um, equals 99. Whenever you want, Randall. Ha, oh, or one no, you're almost Parker. <laughs> one Randall um, is almost one Parker. Now, so <laughs> now add, so if you go to the generated code, I don't know if you want to do a split view here, go to the generated code, you should see Randall oh, yeah, in all the places. Yeah. Now look, I define it just all product, all sum. But then luckily there's answer multiplied, right? So now mm -hmm. go and add the annotation to Randall. Add the multiplier mm -hmm. annotation to Randall. Now Randall's going to be a 10 Give that 11. Program. Give that 11. So his total is a little bigger. Okay. So now what you see is I am generating. So the one below, I am generating one output for everything in the library. 
there is one output for the sum generator for the whole library, one piece of text. Hmm. The thing on top, if you have this annotation, I generate one output for every annotated member. Yep, yep, yep. Follow me? So yep. let's go look at those implementations to see how that works. Indeed, let's. So this is going to be back in example, of course, not example course. usage. And I'm in lib source and here. Oh. And so we can look at the prop, the property sum generator. Okay. And we'll see that that is just a generator, just a generator. Okay. I'm going to go back to a single view here. Sure. And go a little bigger and lower this one day we'll get this figured out okay property sum generator oh this looks super super familiar we were looking at this earlier great right. and but now yeah so we've seen this so num all sum and if i go back to the generated file all sum there it is and and other interesting things here so what source gen also does is if you have a number of generators that generate a specific part in this case they all get prefixed. Sure, save that, rerun it. This takes a little bit longer because now the rebuild, now it has to rebuild, but it's not rebuilding the inputs. It actually restart build and reconsume the builder definition. So right. that will always take longer. If you change your inputs, the inputs, it's insanely fast. If you change the builder definition itself, it's slower because this has to like rehydrate the More universe. foundational. Yep, yep. But there you go. So you see every okay. property sum generator above there, right? You know, so I, I insert a nice little text. Say, These are all the things from this generator. So mm -hmm. it's very clear where it came mm -hmm. from. If you want to override the two string on your generator to put something else here, you are welcome to whatever you want to do. Mm -hmm. Now let's go look at the other one. Which one was that? The uh, multiplier generator. Yes, yes, yes. So now you see this is not inheriting from generator or extending generator. It's extending generator for annotation. Okay. Yep. 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 So this is so what this is is a generator for an annotation, and it says for what mm -hmm. annotation? Okay. This is multiplier. Okay. So a class. So now what this and annotations are just classes that have to have a const constructor. Okay. Yep. That's it. So what this does is says, oh, instead of running for once for every library, I'm going to run once for every element in a library with that annotation. Okay. Yep. And instead of yep. giving you a library reader, I give you an element, which represents the annotated thing. Mm. So the thing that is annotated, that is the element. Yep. I also give you a constant reader, which is a reader that lets me read the values off the annotation. And then the build step. All right. So let's look at how you did these. So, so you read so actually, the value. Really quick here, just humor me. Go yep. up to the definition of um, generator for um, our generator annotation. for annotation. Yeah. And this is where I remember I'm not crazy. Go down to scroll down. Doo -doo 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 -doo. Generate. Oh. oh, the stream thing. Is that what you're talking about? Oh, so generate I, is just returns a string. Go down to the, the, so this is, you don't implement this. What you implement is scroll down, scroll down, scroll down. This generate for annotated element. And this okay. is dynamic. So this so that's what can be the stream stream of string or list of stream. And if you grow, yeah. scroll up a little bit, the implementation of generate does oh, all the insane work to suck in the outputs and return one string value. Uh, and then normalize generated output is where you're going to check all the things that this could have returned. And the normalized. So the other thing is you can yield the same output many times. So what's nice about this as well is if you're generating and you want to generate helpers, mm -hmm. um, it'll make sure that the output you got doesn't have the same thing twice. If you return the exact same element in a list or a stream, it'll just only emit it once. And so there are cases where you want to like em emit a helper for doubles. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe you run into 15 double things. Instead of keeping track as a generator, oh, like have I... I have, have I, I done emitted this, this already? It just takes it care of it. Dedupes, it essentially. It dedupes. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. That kind of stuff. So okay. Anyway. So I wanted to look at this. So this annotation thing, I, I've definitely never done this before. So annotation is... Can you uh, describe again? So the element sure. was the thing that was annotated. And then what does this do again? 
So go to the the, out, the input library source Dart. Sorry, go where Libra oh, library source this one. Yeah, yeah. So okay. I instantiate ish. It's not really instantiated, right? It's all metadata. It's all like it doesn't actually nude up at runtime, right? It just exists as metadata. Mm -hmm. A multiplier and multiplier has a field on it value. It's a that's a number. Okay, that's that's yep. the annotation. So this we don't. This is actually where mirrors comes in and other stuff, right? Like this class is never actually instantiated. We just construct all of the stuff that makes it and put it in a bucket in the analyzer AST to look at. Mm. So it seems like we're newing up a class here, like at runtime. It's actually never newed up. We just create this bucket of metadata that's stored in the analyzer that lets you go poke in. Like if this were instantiated, what would it look like? And so that's what we do here. So I can go annotation dot read. I'm reading well, where in the, do the value numbers 10 and 11 sit in value. So multiplier but, is a class that has a field name value. Right. And there aren't in, there aren't two instances of multiplier. So instance in terms of like the runtime representation, they don't actually exist because it's just metadata. But what the analyzer does is it constructs like a pseudo implementation. Like it, it, can, it constructs the structure of the const in like analyzer world that lets you, so you, you can poke into it and go annotation.read, I pass in a string value, then I have to say, I want the literal value from that string, and then I th as number. So like there's a bunch of stuff here that's a little bit of pain in the rear end. Yeah, this line, it. so candidly, yeah. this line feels extremely challenging to deduce and like figure out what to write unless you just already know. So what it's saying is, I have an, um, an app, so the type of annotation is not mm -hmm. multiplier. I have this multiplier class. You can't actually, and there's a bunch of reasons I'm gonna lose people if I get into it. It's just, it's complex, just trust me. Okay. We never instantiate multiplier because that would mean a bunch of stuff that just gets weird. So instead okay. what we do is we're like annotation represents the, the abstract notion of multiplier. Multiplier has a value on it, a, a field called value. That okay. is a literal value, like a dart literal, like a bool or a string. Those are all literals. Mm, yep. Yep. And yep. I can say as num. And so the analyzer does the work to let me read that constant value and pop out, uh, instantiate, and realize a real number from that annotation. Okay. Got it. So that's where okay. I get 11 and 10 from. That's where num value is. And now it's actual number. Got it. And then what I return is I return num, that's return type of my function, a function named whatever that element is named yep. multiplied mm -hmm. and then i say oh so now you see so element is the element in the source so i i annotated um yep. answer and i yep. annotated um randall yep right yep. so i get this a function sense. called randall multiplied and then what is the output of that the output of that is a dart literal randall times 11 so go back to the source code go back to the generator sorry so the name Randall times whatever mm -hmm. that numeric value is. So from this line value here, this came from the name of the field on the In multiplier. The so that's here. Yep. Right. And then literal value, like this value has is a coincidence that it matches value here. Right. I mean, go literal meaning, value but, means it's a sure. literal, like you said. Yes. Uh, okay. Now, and so this what is just weird. Method return. Oh, read also Another returns constant a reader. constant reader. Constant reader is also helper classes that exist in source gen. Thank you, Matan, who did some of this work. And constant reader is just helpers on top of dealing with constants because there's a bunch of stuff. Why don't you just make 10 louder? Sure. This exactly. one goes to 11. <laughs> It's so funny. I'm, I try to be so hyper aware of like cultural context. Like you said, like duck, like if it walks like a duck, it quacks like a duck. I'm like, that's such an American euphemism. And also like, you know, of course, everyone watching this live stream has seen Spinal Tap. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> I, wa I want to make all those jokes. And I'm like, I feel our wonderful people all over this wonderful world. I'm like, you all should watch Spinal Tap. Not with your kids. Um, but it it's is quite silly. Yeah. Yep. Um, uh, how do you feel about yeah. this so far, Greg? Um, I, yeah, I think it's coming together for me. I kind of want to, I'm, I'm interested probably in the future. I, I don't think it makes sense to start it now, but 
in in a future stream, I may take a crack at the two string generator that we were going to write, um, and then have that just be its own part. Uh, but I think that would make it, you know, really come together, really congeal for me. But it this is now making sense and probably most helpfully this tour of the source gen repo and like where to go, how to start playing, which files to pull up, what command to run, you know, that really unlocks anyone just kind of tinkering with it and in seeing, you know, I turn this dial, what changes, um, which is of course how one would actually, it's what I would do in this hypothetical episode right. and how anyone would, would really learn this stuff. You have to spend so, some time on it. So before we talk about macros, I'm happy to talk a little bit ma about macros. Again, I'm mostly a fan of macros. I'm not on the implementation team. So I, I need to be careful mm -hmm. the authority with which I speak. Before we get into that, just to close up the conversation here, given what people played with. So I think it is easy. Like I would encourage people to either go into the example folder in the build repo, run build runner, watch, tinker a little bit, see the output, have your git diff tool up so you can see the delta, do the same thing in source gen, just kind of like small tweaks. There are we, like, we needed strings here because we need to parse some, like once we parse the dark code, we're already far into it, right? Like. The build system, once it starts parsing the Dart code itself, it's deep in the world already. Because builder, actually, there is a weird world where like a builder could generate a builder and then that builder runs in the build system. It gets weird. Mm. So we needed to have text files that were not Dart source that could help us map out the universe before we started running Dart source. And so that's why you have these build.yaml files. And again, it's all the stuff we talked about earlier that we hate because it's text and it's repeating stuff, which is ironic. <laughs> yeah. But so before you go in too far, try to realize you need to be careful. The configuration of your builder in build.yaml matters. I have examples. If you look in the source gen repo in build.yaml, I try to be very explicit every line, why that line exists, what it means. Um, like there'll be dragons there. Um, well, let's that. look at one of those real quick, just to make sure everyone knows so open build. If you're going to implement these things, look mm -hmm. at build.yaml in the example folder. Okay. Uh, example folder, build.yaml. Here we go. Okay. So member count is the easiest one. And look, I try very hard every line here to explain. So these are the mm -hmm. builders. These are all the builders that you define in this package. This is the name of the builder. So this member value count. can be anything. It's not this member count is not a reserved sacred word or anything it and but when your user configures your builder that is the text it uses to configure your builder in their build.yaml so th Got that's it. where that string matters okay. it says yep. where is the code for the builder defined it's looking for a function that returns a builder in what library there's the library source gen example builder.dart Got it. Okay. Of all the stuff in that library what is the factory what is the function that I go get Yep, example.lib. Yep. Where That's where we go. Yep. Like source gen example is this one? Yeah. So multiplier was the one we we're looking at there, right? Oh, metadata library builder. That's the builder. Okay. And so all builder functions have to have the shape, returns a builder, and takes mm -hmm. in builder options. Okay. Okay. And we and happen so, to. Yeah. Yeah. So this is okay. specifying that. Yep. 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 Okay. Um, Go back to build.yaml. The extension. So, what are my inputs? What what are the types of files I take in, and what type of files I type of files I write? That's so for every Dart file, I generate an info.dart file. Okay, and this is the thing that you were saying. There's a, been a ticket for like throwing an error if these are out of sync, and that would be better. Or just haven't gotten to it yet because there there is a a divergence in this. Right, one of them is like. Dart.info no, or, or in something the different. build repos thing, I do info.json in the build.yaml, but it's just .info in the thing. Yeah. And that's, yeah. and the, this will blow up if you have builders on builders. And so it only manifests if in certain contexts where things can get out of sync. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, the short version here is this right there should match exactly the extensions the builder returns. Okay. Hmm. Okay. Auto apply. Yeah. 
Um, yeah, generated extension info.dart. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And since all everything in source gen always comes off Dart files, you don't need to specify the extension dot Dart. Everything in source gen targets Dart Dart dot Dart files. Got it. Auto apply. There probably should be dependence. Um, usually, it's like in some cases mm. you can run a builder that affects everything you import, and they're, that's what Anal Angular did. Um, um, I should probably change that in this context to say it should only run on code in the importing library. Um, build, there's another package called build. So this is, that's weird. Um, <laughs> so what, one question I have for you here also, is the spec of this YAML file written out somewhere? Like where would I read? Yes, so build config list? is the package. So there's a separate package called uh, build config that's just for configuration. There you go. And the readme, here's here's the sources and release, yeah, all great. this stuff. Wonderful. So I we were looking at auto apply and, and auto apply should probably be scroll down to the bottom where auto apply is specified. Here it probably go. should just be all... root package, which is apply this to the package that imports that you're running build runner on and nothing else. Got it. But there are cases where you can generate code into dependent packages and it gets weird. And that was really for what Angular needed. Most people should just do root package. And the final thing is where you build to. So do I actually build to the actual source directory or do I build to cache? Mm. And this again is little, so I'd say if you're doing a part builder, which is if you want to just like for every element generate a thing, you're gonna do a part mm -hmm. builder, which is the next section. And what you do is you build the cache there, and then there's another builder that takes all these individual little outputs and glues them all together for you. And that's for another stream. Got um, it. It's, it's, okay. it's I, again, folks, this is complicated. Um, and let's so let's get into macros, actually. I think this is this is actually a good thing. Okay. Um, yep. So we built the build system to support our web story before it was Angular, before it was Flutter Web. Um, and then like so many things at Google, like it worked well, it works great for the things we use it for, JSON serializable, freezed. Um, I have a bunch of packages, you know, build version, build CLI, it works great. It never got to the point where like, oh, this is like, we want everyone in the world using this or, or especially creating these generators. Like it's not, mm -hmm. it's not super user friendly. It isn't. Right. It, it's, yep. it just like Jake right now, Jake could be going right now and fixing all these bugs in build and making build much easier with better errors and better documentation. Mm -hmm. But instead, Jake is working on macros. Yeah. And for anyone so, who didn't just connect all the dots there, Jake is the, is he the TL or he's the main just, implementer of macros? He's, right? a, he's, he's the implementer. Bob did, yeah. um, Bob did the spec work and in, in, with Jake's help, frankly, it's all a big language team. Yeah, yeah, and, all yeah. of them. and Jake's doing most of the implementation work with Constantine on the analyzer team. So if you're sitting here banging, you're like, why is build.yaml so confusing? Why aren't the errors better? Why are there better docs? It's like, because we're trying to work on the thing that we're really proud of. <laughs> and we're doing it very <laughs> carefully. So yeah, yeah. if you're watching the stream, it's just like, oh, interesting how this works, right? And like, if you're mm -hmm. really adventurous, go look at the source code for Jason Serializable and see what a fever dream that is. Because that's my fever dream. Um, and I tried to structure <laughs> it well. And even that is actually really cool. So there's all these types in Dart you care about, right? And I want to be able to have mm -hmm big int and duration and date time and serialize yeah. those things correctly and deserialize those. Um, but I also want to have lists yeah. of those things, or I want to have lists of maps of those things, or I want to have a map that has integers in the key store, but Jason, you can't have integers in the key. They have to be strings. So mm. certain types of values will allow to be keys in your maps, but they have to be certain types of values and will auto convert do will do int dot parse at int dot two string to do to and from the key. It's like all these permutations. So if you look at the source code mm -hmm. to JSON serializable, you'll get a headache. But it's it's just me having my most fun, not worrying about <laughs> being the most maintainable code because I'm I'm the only one who deals with it. So I generate the readme. Well, we all use it, and God bless yeah. you. <laughs> so like the readme for JSON serializable is generated with a builder, and I enumerate in the builder all of the types that are supported by JSON serializable, and I update the mm. readme to list here are the types. So if I ever add a new type to JSON serializable, the readme will automatically get updated okay, to include yeah. that this type is supported. And did, do I remember correctly that you also generate unit tests? So if I add a new type to JSON serializable, I can add 
one field into a file somewhere. So I now support, I don't know, symbol. I don't support symbol, but if I wanted to decide I wanted to support right. some new type in Dart, then I will go through and generate tests that are like lists of this thing and maps of lists of this thing and mm -hmm. a nullable version of this thing versus a non-nullable version of this thing. That's and great. I've caught in so many bugs with that. It is really, really mm -hmm. nice. There are cases where it's like, oh, like the nullable handling of a thing versus the non-nullable handling, or there's a there's the ability to do um, checked, which is this whole crazy thing in JSON serializable. So you get really nice errors if there's a parsing error in your JSON and shows you what line you're on when it's parsing. It's crazy. Mm. So I I have I'll have one base set of tests and then use a generator to create different flavors of the same test, but with check mode on or with nullability stuff turned on or off or with like all this other argument parsing. And so I take one test and I create four separate versions of the test and flavors of the test in different configurations to make sure they all generate correctly. So it's like builders on builders. It's wonderful. But so it's great for me as this is why this is kind of getting to my I'll get to macros in a second. So it's great for me as the implementer that understands all this stuff. Oh, my God, if I get hit by a bus and someone else had to take it over. So keep this in mind, like the compiler, that's a compiler. Mm -hmm. Sometimes mm -hmm. that's a bad thing because now you have this magic thing that is much more complicated. Mm -hmm. Like if I had to write a thousand two JSON functions, it's a thousand things I have to maintain and keep track of and keep track of the strings. It's a pain in the rear end. But any Dart developer after two months can read any one of those individual files or functions right. and understand what is happening. Yep. You need to be deep into the religion of JSON serializable to understand the nuance of like, oh, if I'm encoding a map value, but the keys are nullable strings, like do I encode the nullable string as the string null and differentiate that from the nut? Like, and I don't think I do that, but like, like you are now judging anyone who wants to understand this and tweak it to a much right. higher level. Right, right. So keep that in yeah. mind before you throw out exactly before you say I'm going to solve everything with tooling and generators and create complex generators because now everyone in the engineering team 95% of the time will be delighted this magic happens but when it and breaks, breaks. Yeah. who understands how it's implemented so this is the cautionary right. tale so deep breath this leads us to macros deep breath macros oh, so macros I'll actually are, I'll take a swig too yeah. So macros are the next step in this world where it takes the stuff we learned from build, which is hermeticity is really nice. So you cannot overwrite a file in macros or overwrite a member. But what we discovered in build is sometimes it's really nice to put in like a placeholder. Like I want to say I want a constructor in this class and I want a constructor to be built for me. But right now there's no way to do that. You can't mix in a thing and have it take the constructor it's weird. So if you look at from JSON, for instance, in JSON serializable, I will generate a top level function that is from JSON. You have to wire up your own my class, factory my class dot from JSON and arrow to that top yep. level function to give you. There's yep. no way in Dart. You can't do it with a mix in. You can't mix in a function. Actually, for a while, yeah, what I had. It's kind while, of a, had, it's a painful limitation. So for a while, I'm sure it's justified, but yeah. Oh yeah. So for a while in JSON serializable, I had a mix in that gave you your two JSON. So you just mix in your two JSON, but then mm -hmm. I had, you still had to wire up your factory. So I'm like, this is too confusing. So now it's just functions. I just give you functions. And then, so now you have to manually write your stub for two JSON, mm -hmm. but at least it's consistent. So the factory and the two JSON, both of those, I have this, I invented the convention that I guess everyone agreed on now, which is underscore dollar sign, which is a private thing that's generated to differentiate, mm -hmm. you know, so I give you the two JSON from JSON functions and all that stuff. So there's a few things that we did and that are being proposed in macros. I mean, very clear. It's a proposal. I think we're optimistic. You know, there's always the uh, Kanye West, not Kanye West. Oh my gosh. Cornell West. Very different. Um, <laughs> Cornell West. <laughs> um, wow. Speaking of cultural references, Cornell West has this whole thing. It's like, I'm not optimistic, but I'm hopeful. Um, so I'm very mm. hopeful that we'll get macros and I'm pretty optimistic. It's still hard. And part of the reason here is doing it wrong is such a huge tax. Having a thing that's a 70% solution with lots of rough edges, because then we need to support it forever. And it, it just be an albatross over our uh, albatross. Like it'd be a huge burden to have a, a bad code system. So like, is it sounds like build runner. 
<laughs> right. And Build Runner is amazing for what it can do. It did as, it's, mm -hmm. it's as good as it can be and not be integrated into Dart. Because, um, for instance, if it's part of Dart, do you want the whole analyzer API in the SDK? Because now if you roll the SDK and you want to do a breaking change to the language, like you can't do a breaking change to the analyzer because then everyone, you know, like it's a hard problem. Like how do you, yeah. where do you find this thing and how do you deal with versioning of the thing? And so they're trying to solve all this with macros. Um, so macros, one thing that exists, people that have done C sharp, I think this is against other places, is partial, effectively partial classes. There's a different name for it. But basically I can create, I can have a class defined in multiple files. And in fact, I could have like my hand authored version of the class and I can put in stubs. So it kind of feel like abstract members, but they're not. They're like here's a stub where a thing that returns an int is and just have an empty function. I think I could, there's an, a name you put on it or something like a stub. Um, and what's nice then is I can code against that file, just like you're talking about Python. I can code against that file. Anything looking at that file is like, oh, there's a, a member here, get some. Let's say it's get some function. <laughs> um, get some, ha, S-U-M. Yeah. Um, uh, and I can code against it and statically analyze it and the body's just mi missing. And then I can generate a separate Dart file in macros that actually has the implementation of that. Mm -hmm. Make sense? So mm -hmm. we, I, I forget, it's, it's not aspects. There's some name that they've invented for this thing, which is the ability to actually define a class in multiple files. And so mm -hmm. this way I'm not overwriting a thing. You don't want a world where I overwrite that source file, right, in memory. Because now the, now the offsets for source maps are off, right? If I'm debugging, it's like, oh no, because there's mm -hmm. a body now for this function. You want that right. in a separate logical place. But the definition of the function, this is this is the stub where the function is defined, and this is the actual implementation, and they're two different places, and they're a way to resolve that. So that's coming. Mm. The other funny thing, and I'm about 70% sure I'm gonna get this right, is again hermeticity and maximally incremental. You want both of those. So this actually in stages. So there's stages in macros. So it starts out with um Define, I, th I think this is this is roughly right. I might be a little bit off in the details. I'll get you the, the philosophy I think is correct. So like, it's like, am I defining types? Am I defining top level members? And am I defining implementations? And those mm. each mean a thing. So if I am generating code, it really matters what the interface is, what are the available types really matters. Because if I implement or extend something or something else, something else implements or extends my type or mixes in, that affects mm -hmm. the whole class hierarchy. So yep. you want to define that early so that all that reasoning can figure out. And then if I define a function that returns a type or takes in certain arguments, that affects how people call me and if that function's about function call or whatever else. So that's at a different level. And the final thing is I want to offer an implementation to a function. And you can mm. imagine, obviously, if I implement a function in different ways, I might reference other types or other things. But I can. it doesn't change how I statically reason about that function. Because I know the arguments on the inputs, I know the return type, whatever. So macros have phases. I, I define where I want to plug in. Am I defining new types? Am I defining new members on a type? Or am I just providing implementations? Hmm. And what's nice there is now if I'm just defining implementations, I can be really, really, really fast increment. I can do really fast incremental compilation with really good hermeticity. Because it's like, you're not changing the type signature or anything. You're not changing the type hierarchy of anything. You know, you're just doing implementation. And so the, the folks who did macros are trying to be very mindful of, like, how am I plugging into the system? And how can that affect the ability for the tooling to be crazy fast? And so you'll have these facilities available. Um, it's not, it is going to be part of the build process. Like, it's going to happen... It's gonna be, yes, I would I would highly recommend people look at the spec. Um, it's a high level. It's, again, it's long. A fun exercise, yeah. um, but it's interesting. Like you'll you'll see all these mm -hmm. concepts. Um, so, but the benefit of all this is that now the analyzer will understand what's going on, and so you don't have to wait for this external process to run. Like the analyzer immediately will understand the codes being generated. I don't know if they exactly have the. I think the user interface is actually starting to get figured out. So. The file actually won't be on disk. It actually won't be checked in. I had some issues about this. There's a part of me who really likes checked in build code because mm. sometimes I just want to help her. Like I just want, I just want my little Smurf elf, whatever, to do my work for me. And then when the Smurf's not there, like the code's on disk. And until mm -hmm. I decide to run mm -hmm. the generator again, just imagine I wrote it by hand. 
right? Now that yeah, this... one nice thing about it being on disk also, I mean, I presume that they'll they'll arrive at the same user or developer experience via a different way. But, you know, for example, with Freeze and JSON Serializable, one thing I, I love about JSON Serializable is when you actually declare a converter uh, and then you drop into the generated file, you know, you can see how your declaration impacted it. And it's like, oh, that to JSON and from JSON I wrote in the converter. It makes sense. They're being called, they're being used in a perfectly coherent way. Um, and the the visibility into what's being generated, but if it if it's not on disk, is it going to like appear ephemerally in the IDE as yes. if it's on disk? I think so. So the okay. implementation of macros is all at the, we call it the kernel level. So it's before the analyzer. There is some analyzer plugging in for it, but like, and so the kernel is the thing that takes Dart source code and generates an AST that all the compilers can use. And so the analyzer, so it's one implementation, right? We don't have many implementations of macros. It's implemented once, it's in the kernel. And so if you have the analyzer running and you're stepping through things or jump to definitions, you, you'll you see, I think there'll be a ghost in the IDE. I should actually look, it's available, I should play with it. Um, like you can see the ghost in the IDE. So like this is what, like it, it effectively is dark code. You're generating strings, which is just mm -hmm. easy to read about. And then at compile time, the compilers, and I, th I don't know if there's a shared cache of the analyzer so they can sh share the, you know, share the generation. I have no idea. Um, but at runtime, effectively, those files will be synthesized and then the compilation will happen. And then you'll end up with one static output as though those files are real. When I say files, I think of quotes. Uh, yeah, so the comments is kernel in, yeah, is it in there? Um, it's so funny because there is a kernel package that's not published. Actually, it is published because the analyzer package needs it. Um, I think kernel is the definition. I think CFE and kernel are, in, as far as I'm speaking here, they're the same thing. There's a little bit different, but yeah. Kernel, I think, is the output. It's like the definition of the thing. It's kind of the AST for Dart. I, I Leaf might be in here now smacking me or Bob, but you know, they, they're very related. At, at a minimum, they're very, very related, the common front end and the kernel. Yeah. Um, so people were talking about recently, like on I saw on X, Twitter, whatever the kids are calling it, like, oh, Twitter. macros are available. Um, it's This is the beauty of open source. It is there. You can turn on the flag and go hack. Do not ship anything that uses macros right now, please. And please don't, <laughs> because you'll, everyone will be sad. Um, yeah, uh, you can really paint yourself into a corner there. Yes. No current um, details have any kind of long-term support or even necessarily short-term support. And it might support. change dramatically. Um, yeah. If you're curious, go play with it. Um, you know, of course, it's, this is the beauty of open source. Like I don't, you know, it's, um, but you know, running tutorials, because you want to get medium hits, and then our poor other users who don't know have all the context are like, this is a thing. And they go build a business, you know, whatever. But I think it's powerful. We will be very clear that the folks, Bob and Jake Leaf, like we just have such thoughtful people in this space. We will be very clear when we're ready for people to experiment with it, to try it out. We will let you know. And we will be excited for you to come play with macros when they're available. Um, Incredible. And yeah. Um, but well, in the meantime, and in the meantime for the build system, Again, I think I offered the, con the, the context there, which is obviously freeze and JSON serializable are great. Use those. You know, it's we may try to make it very straightforward. I want to be clear. People have sent me so many issues on JSON serializable. Every it's like this matrix problem, right? So they just like I want this feature, and they don't realize it's cross cutting across everything. And so I have to go touch every aspect of JSON serializable. And I'm just one. I'm crazy busy because I'm trying to get Wasm out. And two is the added complexity of every additional feature gets hard. Mm -hmm. It really is crazy. So I'm not trying to be mean. I'm not ignoring, I am, I would say I'm not ignoring. I see your requests and I hear you, um, but it's a tricky problem space. So yeah. Um, yep. um, I'm glad people have fun here. And if you want to do your own builder, it is nice. Realize macros are coming um, and just be cognizant of like, you know, it's not as pretty and pristine a starter thing as many of the things we try to do in Flutter. It's kind of like a tool, we call it dark tools. So it's like a lower level thing in the dark world in terms of we maintain it, we keep the lights on, it works for things we care about, but it really is kind of a special case thing. Um, mm. So if you're used to a level of support and understanding, it's not there and it's just, we're trying to be mindful about where we're spending our resources. So if I had infinite resources, of course, I'd have two people full-time on the build system, um, but we have to be, pick and choose. So we're picking macros. 
And I think that's a better investment. All right, uh, Kev, thank you so much from taking- Was that good? Was that okay? Oh, well, I mean, who am I to judge? I'm all right. I'm also, <laughs> I'm in the same spot as you here, hoping it was good. Uh, folks will, will maybe let us know. Um, we've got one thanks that I, oh, with a, I love when I'm about to click something and then a new chat message comes in, <laughs> though the, the applause functionally similar. Uh, two votes of this having not been totally terrible. Kev, thank you so, so much. Uh, this was extremely helpful for me. I I once, over a year ago, tried to tinker with code generation by just diving straight into JSON serializable and seeing if I could reverse what was going on there. And I thought, this is bananas and walked away from it and didn't really ever think about it again. And now I see that I was like, you know, trying to learn to read by picking up an Encyclopedia Britannica. And it's like, well, this isn't very approachable. It's like, like Beowulf, actually. Like, like it's it's yeah. old English. There's a bunch of, you know. Um, yeah, like, and just, just to give some shout outs for folks that are curious. Um, builders that I build that are, so build version is crazy simple. It creates a Dart file with the version that's in your pub spec. So that's mm -hmm. a very simple builder to go understand, build version. Um, there's a package called build verify, which is a tester that will run your build in CI and then fail if the version checked in is different than the version generated by the build. Because sometimes people for forget to run their build there before they check in a package and commit it to GitHub. Mm. So build verify will keep you sane there. There's a package called source gen test, which is something that I wrote that helps you test source gen. And instead of creating files on disk, it lets you do little library snippets and then verify that it matches a snippet. Um, so it's much easier to quickly verify a bunch of different things. So source gen test is a package mm. there. Um, nice. There is um, build CLI, which will, because you think about encoding, decoding, right? It's like encode JSON to a Dart instance. Arg parsing is the exact same thing. I want to take a string that happens to be the format of arguments, and often you want to just generate a Dart class where I have mm. strings and integers and Booleans yep. and everything else. Build CLI will do that for you. It's That is also complicated because anytime you deal with encoding and decoding types and type values, yeah, it's yeah. complex. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. build CLI is certainly simpler than JSON serializable. Um, I think that's it. Yeah, so build verify, well, those are, yeah. build Great. version, build CLI. Those are good things to go look at and build test. I mean, source and test are good things to go look at and play with if you're curious about learning more or doing more stuff. Yeah, great ways to learn by example. Um, okay, well, that will do it for us today. Everyone who's tuned in live, uh, thanks for joining. Thanks for asking a lot of questions and, uh, you know, flagging when we were going too fast and being confusing. You weren't alone. I was confused there a few times. Like, hey, sorry, hey. I talk fast too. Uh, I know it's a lot. Don't no, be scared. No, Go good. slow. You'll be good. Yeah, yeah. And I'm Ke I'm Kev Moo on GitHub, Reddit, X, I think Threads now. I don't know. Um, and you can find my domain and so links to other talks I've done and stuff. You can find on my my weird vanity domain. This link on my socials. Um, come find me. Social media dot com slash kevmu whichever social media you're you're doing at a given moment um <clears throat> links are the the chat monster often eats links so if you try to type in one it, it might might go away anyway folks i love you all next week we've got a special episode with a a new google product just coming out so get excited uh i for, i don't know exactly who my guest is going to be i think i know but i don't want to say their name in case I have that wrong. Um, but it should be a very fun episode. I'm looking forward to it. And uh, until then, have a great week, everyone. Ciao. Thank you, Craig.